So welcome, Brent, to our podcast. Welcome, Brent. Thank you, Ruben. Thank you, Tim. Uh, you're a director at Twice Born Global, um, and uh, you are a sales leader as well. Can you tell a little bit more about the previous role that you had and set a little bit the scene there, because that was at the B2B, B2B company, if I'm not mistaken, in Africa, correct? That, that's correct. So from 2014 to 2021, I was the managing director of a business called Selected Supplies. Um, B2B primarily, we did do B2C as well. Uh, very much a traditional brick and mortar business. And we were trading in three countries being Mozambique, Zimbabwe and Zambia at the time. We were servicing primarily fleet owners, as in long haul trucking fleets. Uh, and we were providing them primarily with physical products, so we, which we had warehouses in all of those locations. You could call the, the industry that you were active in. So can you tell a little bit more about the typical customers that they had and how, uh, what was their needs and how were you surfacing that need? Yeah, so primarily we, our customer base was made up of long haul trucking fleets. We yeah. also had other industrial customers like mines and ports uh, and, and what have you. Um, but primarily fleet owners, uh, these are fleets anywhere from a handful of, of long haul vehicles up to our biggest customer has close on 1500 long haul vehicles. Um, and they have workshops in all of their different locations. Uh, and they are requiring product on a, on a daily often, but certainly weekly and, and monthly basis. Um, so there was a lot of interaction between ourselves and our, and our ongoing customers, our, our regular customers. Right. And what was the, uh, okay, tell us a little bit about what the sales approach was. So, so how, how does that work in, in that part of the world, but also in that particular industry? So, the, yeah, that's, that's a good point. So the industry itself, and I think globally this is true, uh, is, is quite um, traditional and certainly in that part of the world as well. So as I said, it's a, it's a brick and mortar business. Um, yeah. I would say in general terms, the brick and mortar industry even perhaps in Europe and the US and some of the more developed uh, parts of the globe. Um, so it was very much, you know, relational uh, in terms of how those transactions happened. A lot of time and effort was put into relationships with our, our customers um, and even uh, down to understanding the requirements of the products required was very much uh, determined by the experience of the sales teams involved, being able to not only speak the, ac the same actual language as our customers, but actually to see speak the same technical language as our customers. Um, but, but ultimately, that, all of that um, sort of winds up in it being quite a, a manual sales process as compared to certain other, other industries. And what, what does manual, so uh, selling, in, selling in that part of the world for me is completely new. What does manual mean in that part of the world? Okay, so let me, <laughs> let me give you an example. And this is, this is really with our blue chip customers who had good systems and, and good staff on their side. So this is kind of a best case scenario was uh, we would every morning from a multitude of customers receive a request for quotes that would come in via email. Um, then it would be a more often than not a senior member of the sales team sitting down interpreting the SKUs on the request for quotes and translating that into the actual manufacturer SKU, right? Which is very time consuming, determining mm. what those products are, then checking the ERP, which was actually very developed and, and well-maintained. Okay, these are the items that are in stock. These are the prices. These are alternatives, perhaps, for items that are not in stock. And then these are the items that are not in stock. Alternatives are not in stock, but they're on the way and we can give a sort of an ETA on those products, push all of that information back. And I, I'm sure you can understand that's already taken a few hours. It's now got back in the hands of the customer. They've sent the same request for quote to various suppliers. So that they will now cherry pick which items they actually want to purchase from you. And mm. so you get like a shorter list, which has been converted into an actual uh, purchase order. Then we receive that back. It goes into the warehouse process. There's a picking and packing that happens there and, and more than likely a, a delivery. So realistically, you know, for, for larger orders or even medium to size, medium size orders, sometimes the customer is only getting the product in his hands in the afternoon because of the actual time taken to, to work through that process. And that's, as I said, that's with our blue chip customers. There were other customers who were smaller who had... 
you know, less evolved systems on their side, uh, less human capital that they could throw at it. And, and in those instances, you know, it became even more cumbersome than that, if you can believe it. Wow. And how did, let's say, the e-commerce uh, play a potential role for you there? Um, or did it? Yeah. Well, we discussed e-commerce back and forth for years, you know, um, and we did see benefits, potential benefit to it, um, certainly, as you would anywhere. Um, uh, one of the main benefits that, that we were particularly intrigued by was a higher degree of integration with our customers. And in that industry, that's kind of, that would be a critical piece to really getting a foothold. Um, and by integration, I mean actual IT integration between your ERP or your e-commerce uh, setup with whatever system they're using in their workshop, in their stores, in their warehousing. Not only for the, you know, the simple things which would already have saved a lot of time and effort, which would have been, you know, inventory visibility, pricing, quoting, uh, even transacting, um, but also for the purposes of planning. Uh, we were in a part of the world where we faced lead times with our manufacturers of up to four months. And when you're in a particularly volatile industry in a volatile market, four months is a very, very long time. So yeah. as well as we could plan, we were reliant on what was happening with our customers' businesses. And if we yeah. had the insights with them on you know, anything demand-related on their side, um, that would have just resulted in our projections being all the more accurate, which ultimately, yes, it would have benefited us, but at the same time, it would have had a massive impact on, on our fleet owner customers and the industry as a whole. What makes the industry, that particular industry, so volatile? I think the environment in which it operates. Um, also, you know, there's a lot of moving parts to it. Uh, so, so if you look at the environment in those economies, those economies are not particularly stable. Those currencies are not particularly stable. Um, that actual um, geographical area is also increasingly um, hit by tropical cyclones, believe it or not. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so, so there are instances, and we, we have this, you know, where roads get washed away, um, where the port is cut off. You know, so that, that in itself is obviously a massive challenge. The, the currency is a challenge. Uh, the economy is a challenge. But also, I think when, when you are a support industry to, to a transport uh, industry itself or a transport market, there's so many elements to that chain, you know. So, we, yes, we were looking after the long-haul truckers on the ground where we were trading, but they were at the whim of what was happening in global shipping, for example. You know, so there were a lot of moving parts and they, they don't necessarily, as your customers don't necessarily have the, have the margin um, to bear all of those um, external shocks. So we had to become incredibly agile as a business to be able to say, look, we understand where our customers are at. We understand where their industry is at. And where their industry is at means that we need to give a little bit in these times to help them out, to see them through the next couple of years so that they're still in existence and thriving when things turn. And we've, you know, we've pulled even closer to, to them relationally and, and obviously commercially as well. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe one other follow-up question. And, and again, this part of the world is relatively new to me um, in terms of B2B commerce. So it's, if you are in Western Europe or, or North America or parts of the Middle East, if you are a B2B business and you are not online yet, you're kind of lagging behind. Is that the same in, in uh, countries like, uh, like Zimbabwe or Mozambique? Or is, is, is e B2B e-commerce as commonplace as it is in, in, in other parts of the world? I would say B2C e-commerce is, is getting there. Um, mm. There's probably still a bit of lag there. Uh, B2B, I would say, is, is lagging further behind um, across the board, across industries. Um, but I do think that there's movement there, and I do think that there's benefit to, to moving into that space. You know, in, in the industry that we're discussing in that part of the world, if you get B2B e-commerce right, you are the industry leader from day one. You'd be a front runner. Right. Absolutely. Gotcha. You know, so, and, and then everyone's chasing you. So uh, <laughs> and, and I'm not saying that that doesn't necessarily mean that it's easy to get that right. And that's yeah. obviously what hasn't been done yet. 
yeah. there's certain structural things that that you would have to address, but there is probably benefits to to going through that painful process um, and being the leader.